Today I'm building one of these nesting beach chairs. They're also known as festival chairs or camp chairs, but we primarily use them at the beach, which is why I've always called them beach chairs. So this is how they work. You take the seat out, turn the back around, and then the seat just drops in like that, packs flat. And you can carry it like this, or up here at the top, I've got a notch, fits your hand. So when you get where you're going, you grab the seat, pull it up, and it comes out. Turn this around, and the seat slots in the bottom here. And there you go. Now I built this set about 10 years ago, but the story goes back about 15 years ago when I saw somebody at camp who had something like this. And then later on I went home and mostly out of my head, but partly from looking online. I built a set, but I made it totally out of wood. So the seat was out of the wood and the back was out of wood and it was beautiful and it was really uncomfortable because <laughs> your back is just not meant to be sitting against something flat. It was just, anyways, had those for a couple of years, gave them away, uh, saw the camp chairs again and took a few measurements, went home, but still mostly out of my head. I, I redesigned it to fit myself and, and we've had them ever since. And I've shown these chairs before on the channel. In fact, my very first horrible video from five years ago was a demonstration about how these chairs worked, but it wasn't a build video. And since I had a, uh, a reason that I needed to make one for a, a gift, I thought, hey, this is a good time for me to revisit this and make a proper build video. I like to make mine out of cherry and maple. Because uh, I really like contrasting woods together, but you could use just about any hardwood But I would strongly recommend you use a hardwood because it's a chair. You're gonna sit on it. You're making it uh, We're making it out of fairly thin pieces because we want it to be light for carrying But you are gonna sit on it. So you need it to be strong. So I wouldn't do a softwood now I'm not really worried about water resistance. So it's like I'm not making this out of uh, Cypress or something like that. This is just, you know, plain old hard maple and cherry. They're not particularly suited to outdoor use, but you don't leave these outside. You take it to the beach, you sit for a couple hours, and you go home and you hang it up in the garage or whatever. Um, so I don't think it really matters. Uh, I would even use red oak if I wanted to, which I would normally never do for an outdoor project. Because again, you're taking it outside for a while, using it, taking it back. Like, but, you know, Time tells the tale. These are 10 years old, as I said, and we use them all the time. Take them to the beach constantly, uh, take them camping, and they're fine. The finish is getting a little worn now, but that's more from wet swimsuits than anything else. I'm building one chair because I only need one, but if you were to tackle this project, I would also strongly recommend that you only build one chair to begin with. Let it be your prototype. The reason is that you really want to make sure that this design fits you, that you like it, that it's comfortable. Back when I was designing these chairs, I actually made two prototypes before finalizing my design. I'll, I'll throw up some pictures here now for you to have a look at. I knocked them together out of scrap wood that I had laying around my shop because I thought it was really important to get the comfort level right, the height and the sitting angle and so on. And then I used that to finalize my plans. Now sure, if you base your build off of my chair, well, you've got my design to work with. And yeah, plans are available. But I still suggest you build just one to begin with, just in case you sit in it, decide you need to change something. So for example, if you were to cut the leg attached to the back shorter, you know, you're gonna lean down more. If you were to cut the leg attached to the seat shorter, you're gonna lean back more. And these two cross pieces, if you adjust the relative position of them, then that's going to affect the angle at which the seat and the back sit to each other. So there's lots of things you can tweak. So long before I got into YouTube, I used to write for this woodworking magazine up here in Canada called Canadian Home Workshop. I wrote a couple articles a year over the course of nine years until they shut down in 2014. There used to be so many woodworking DIY magazines out there and they're mostly all gone now. But anyways, these chairs were the one and only time that I managed to score a cover story on the magazine. And yeah, all these years later, I'm still kind of proud of that. So here's the wood to make one chair. It really doesn't take a whole lot. I got two pieces of maple for the legs on the back. I have the top cross piece and I have the two lower cross pieces here. So five pieces of wood. 
inch and a half by three quarters, half an inch by two inches, and half an inch by an inch and a half for the top cross piece. These two bottom cross pieces, I am using white oak just because I happen to have some. Normally I would use maple. You want it something to be good and strong because here you can see, I'll bring this in close, you can see a bit of a wear there. That's where the, the seat rests. It's going to push on there. It needs to be a good strong piece of wood. The seat is slightly more complicated, but again, inch and a half by three quarter maple inch and a half by three quarter cherry for a cross piece at the bottom. And then I have a bunch of slats. I like to alternate. So I've got cherry, maple, cherry, maple, cherry. Inch and a half wide again, roughly three eighths of an inch thick. These I have not cut the length yet. I want to fit them to the actual chair. And again, I keep a few extra pieces and I still have some of the uh, wood that I use to cut this in case something goes wrong. The slats are the one place where these, you're putting uh, two screws into each slat and uh, I've had them split even with pre-drilling. So I'm going to make the back section first. My legs are cut to 32 inches. My cross pieces are cut to 15. I need to uh, notch the foot out and I need to round over the top. And these are on opposite corners. And I'm not that fussed. I'm just going to get something that's round. And I'm just going to trace it up here in order to get a round over. Now for the cutout at the bottom, I could of course just trace it, but that doesn't help you at all. The thing to keep in mind is that I measure up five-eighths of an inch on the leg and I measured this way, seven-eighths of an inch on the leg and I just connect the two pieces. when you start assembling the back it's really important that these two sides are parallel which can be challenging with these widely separate pieces so the smartest thing that I think you can do is find a piece of scrap plywood and rip it to 13 and a half inches and you use that as a place to hold your pieces so that it stays parallel when you get these fastened into place. So I want to cut the hand grip here, which is about four inches long. This is 15. 15 minus four is 11. 11 cut in half is five and a half. So I will set my combination square to five and a half. Let's check out the grain yeah, like that. And five and a half in from each side. And then again, set this down to about a quarter inch. And we will just go right along. And there we've got ourselves set. Now we'll just round the corners and over to the bandsaw. So now we want to assemble the back. I've got my piece of plywood here, my 13 and a half piece of pattern plywood. I've got the two legs clamped to it nicely and I've used the square to make sure they are lined up. Piece at the top is easy, that just goes at the top. The two bottom pieces are the tricky ones, which is what, again, what I figured out with the prototypes. Back, upper, cross piece goes here and that is eight and five eighths above the bottom. On the other side we have the front lower cross piece and that one I've got marked on the other side with also with pencil and that is seven inches above the bottom. And 
note that those two measurements, you know, one is a, a measurement below the slat and the other one is a measurement above the slat. And if you're good on a little bit of math, you realize that that adds up to an inch and five eighths, whereas this is an inch and a half, which means I'm only having about one eighth of wiggle room between these for the let for the seat. That's I found. That's that's what I found with the prototypes. That's all I need. So, a little bit of outdoor glue, and then I'm going to use. I'm using stainless steel screws to attach it. And that's the back. So now should we do the fabric? No. The fabric's the last thing you do because you got to get the finish on before you put the fabric on. So onto the seat and like on the back, the seat has a curve at one end and a notch at the other. However, unlike the back, the curve and the notch are both on the same side of the piece. The notch is one inch up and half an inch over approximately. So I find assembling the seat can be a little bit tricky, again, because you really want to make sure this is parallel and everything lines up. And so like with the back, what I've done is I've made myself a little MDF plywood, scrap piece of plywood sheet goods, 11 and a half inches wide. And then what I do is I put it on the table saw and I clamp it in between the legs and I push the legs up against the fence so that I know it's square. Then I can proceed with getting the bottom cross piece. I put it at four inches from the bottom. It doesn't really matter if you go up or down. It's just to keep the legs set. And once that's in place, then I work on the slats. So again, I put the dab of uh, exterior glue under. I've got the holes drilled and I fasten the slats into place with some stainless steel screws. Do you have to use stainless steel screws? Um, uh, I strongly recommend it because I take these to the beach. And I sit on them with wet swimsuits. So yeah, I think it's a good idea. And it's not really that much of a cost penalty. Okay. With the back cross piece in place and the front slat in place, I can now loosen and get this seat out of here, no, sorry, this, get this pattern out of here and move on with the other slats. I always put first slat and then I'll put the last slat and then the other ones I'll space out. Typically I take one of the 3 8 pieces of wood as a, as a spacer but I still want to put the uh, the far one into position first, and I've forgotten where that is. I have to look up the dimensions. Okay, nine and a quarter. Nine and a quarter inches for the farthest slat. The overhang is one inch, and I've got a little block here where I've marked one inch. Yeah, just throw things on the ground, that's good. So I can get this into the right position. And I've pre-drilled all the screws on the drill press all the screws. I've pre-drilled all the holes on the drill press so that helps also with lining it up. And again, you know, if you're off by an eighth or a sixteenth, that's really not going to matter.
Okay, almost there. We got the back section, we got the seat section. All that's left now is to get on with the finishing and then the last step will be the fabric back. Um, I'm pretty sure this video is getting way too long so I'm going to skip finishing and um, just letting you know, 10 years ago I used this circa 1850 tongue and teak oil. It's exterior rated but it takes 24 hours to dry. Um, that's what I put on these 10-15 years ago. Um, what I bought this time, again easily in the big box store, Watco Danish oil. Um, it has an 8 hour dry time which is why I tried it. Um, so it's a bit, it's it's new to me but it's it's easy enough to reapply or change it if I don't like it. So there we go. Now let's get the finish done. And yeah, the Danish oil is officially an interior rated finish. You should probably use something like the tongue and teak oil. And so finally it's time to get the fabric back installed on the chair. And depending on your situation, that could either be one of the easiest parts of the process or the most difficult. It's because of sewing. Do you have someone in your life who's willing to do a bit of sewing for you or do you know how to sew? All that sort of stuff. I happen to have a wife who knows how to sew and she was perfectly willing to do a bit of sewing for me. So that made it not too difficult. It's a very simple thing. We're talking about a, you know, a rectangular piece of fabric with just simple stitching around the edges. So first let's talk about fabric. Um, I don't know a lot about fabric. So I took my, my wife took me to the store. You want to get some nice, heavy, canvassy sort of thing. This one from 10 years ago is actually really nice and heavy. It might even be awning material. I, I, don't, I don't know. My wife did a very simple stitch for me on the edge. She uses a serger to serge it over. The edge was serged and then it was just folded once and then a simple stitch was done to hold it. Again, here's the chair from 10 years ago. So the fabric goes across the front, wraps around the side, wraps around the back, and then in here it is stapled. Same on both sides. So the measurement this way is pretty simple. You measure from here to there, that's your finished size for your piece of fabric. For the other side, you want to measure up, over, down, all the way across the front, and then again, over and around and there. In my situation, this is 15 inches, this is an inch and a half, and that's, and then the, it's three quarters of an inch thick. So let's start adding that all up. 15 inches. Four, four times an inch and a half, so that's another six inches added to your 15, so you're at 21. And then you have your three quarter of an inch thickness, again times two, so that's an inch and a half. So, just going by the numbers, the finished width of my piece of fabric should be 21, 22 and a half inches. And I'm just about at 22 and a half inches. Bear in mind, it might stretch a bit when you're pulling at it and over the years, like here, this, this one, let me see if I can get that into the camera. Note, see how there's a little bit of give there. I would, you want it to be as tight as possible at the beginning because it's just gonna stretch a bit over time. So I have my fabric laying out face down. Bring the chair, put it into position. Make sure you don't get the back and the front mixed up. And then the fabric wraps over both side legs and then it's stapled here and stapled here. I recommend getting a power stapler. I did this one 10 years ago with a manual stapler. It does work. Um, the maple that I have now I found ridiculously hard and, and I could not get the staples to penetrate even a quarter of the way with a manual stapler. On this one, it's held 10 years long on. So this is the chair from 10 years ago, and a lot of these staples, I can see that they were finished with a hammer manually where I banged them in because they're, they're bent over. And yeah, it's held for 10 years, but uh, depending on how soft your maple is, you could maybe get away with it. But uh, I would recommend a power stapler. It's hard to talk while stapling, or at least it'll be hard for the camera to hear if I talk while stapling. So let me talk you through what I'm going to do here. I have the fabric wrapped around. We're going to go on one side and I'm going to bring the fabric all the way in to the edge. 
of it. I'll put like a staple at one end and maybe one or two part way through to getting the fabric into the position. fabric into the position. Once the fabric is in position, I'm just going to staple all the way along. Um, I want a lot of staples so there's a lot of surface area holding the fabric in position. It's proved well on the, on the other chair. Once this one side is done, then I'll switch to the other side and now I'll be pulling it tight and then repeating on this side. And that's all there is to it. One more thing, as with the screws, stainless steel is what, what I really recommend you want to do here. Go to the store, buy a pack of a stainless steel, staples for your stapler. I mean, this pack of a thousand was less than 10 bucks and it'll last for ages. Um, again, these chairs are not being left outside, but I take them to the beach, I sit on them with uh, wet stutes. I, I don't want, you know, basic steel that's going to get rusty. It's just not worth it after putting all this work into it. Now, on with stapling. And there we go. One finished beach chair. And uh, just for a comparison, there's the 10 year old one. Take it apart, bring the seat around to the back and drop it into place. Now, one last little tidbit. Everybody who's stuck around to the end, you're gonna get a bonus here. The fabric that I'm using this time is a little bit thinner. Uh, hopefully it's not any weaker, but it's a little bit thinner than the fabric that I used 10 years ago. And one thing I noticed, you know, you turn the, turn the seat around and drop it in, it nicely wedges in the place. Um, I already made, I made uh, three of these. Uh, my son got married. They were presents for his groomsmen. I made three of these. This is the fourth one. And as I was making them, I noticed I had an issue where one of them, where the seat would just drop right through. and I. I think I finally realized that the issue was that the fabric was a little bit thin and the thickness of the fabric sort of holds this part of the seat, the seat, it holds the seat up a little bit, which then helps the legs wedge in down below. And I got around that, or I, I added to that by, on this, on this chair, I, I've been saying that these are inch and a half, inch and a half, that's not entirely true. On the seat, they're an inch and a half. On the back, I took my inch and a half boards and I ran them through and I shaved off almost a sixteenth so that these are a little bit wider, which helps them wedge down here so that they stay in place. So that brings us to the end of this project. As I mentioned before, there are plans available. There are links in the description. Uh, you know, from watching the video, you could possibly just figure it out for yourself. But you know, if you pick up a plan, that helps me, helps support the channel, and I greatly appreciate it. As always, thanks for coming by and spending some time. I hope you found something interesting and enjoyable, something to take to the beach or to camp this year. If you feel I've earned it, please subscribe and come back for the next video. And I think that's about it, and we'll see you next time.